Hey guys, it's Dr. Calkins. Uh, today we're doing experiment three, and this is called Elements or Trinity. The reason we say that is because families act the same, that's why we have that family name. And the reason they act the same is because their outer electrons, their valence electrons, are the same number. So quick review, things you should know about an atom is they have protons, neutrons, and electrons. Remember those protons and neutrons added together make the mass number. Electrons are negative, they have a negligible mass because it takes over 1800 to make up the mass of one proton and hydrogen. Core electrons are the electrons that are closest to the nucleus, those are the ones that we don't worry about. The valence electrons, easiest to recognize by the Roman numerals, those are the ones that we care about in the entire semester. We'll talk about orbitals in uh, another experiment, but that's how they're going to be oriented around the nucleus. What we're gonna do is a quick little review about the atom itself and how things are organized. So in a two-dimensional carbon atom, what we know is that carbon has six protons given by its lowest left number, its atomic number, so six protons. But if this is carbon 12, the other part of 12, when you subtract six, is the six neutrons. And that's what we taught you about atoms already. This next part is the important part, and in our stadium of an atom, there's something pretty unique about how it's organized. If you look at the periodic table, the first row recognizes the first orbit, and it only has two electrons. That represents the hydrogen and helium electrons. So if carbon has two electrons of its six, this is kind of where they sit, close to the nucleus. Each period on the periodic table represents another row of electrons around that stadium. And we have seven total, seven total periods. So if carbon has six total electrons, it has a mass of 12, which we already accompanied in the nucleus. We need four more electrons. These are the ones represented by the Roman numerals. These are the ones that determine the carbon chemistry overall. And these four electrons we call valence electrons. The easiest way to find valence electrons, if you're big, like carbon or any other bigger yet kind of atoms, is look at your noble gas. It's gonna tell you your noble gas core, and then pretty much anything left over is typically valence unless you're crossing that group of transition metals and so forth. Lastly, we're gonna answer question two. Question two says, what if you're carbon-14, what changes? Well, carbon-14 is still carbon, so it still has six protons. But if it's carbon-14, it needs a mass of 14, not 12. So really the only thing that changes here is you're gonna have eight neutrons, not six. You're still gonna have six protons that are positive. You're gonna have extra cushion of neutral neutrons floating around, probably in this case making it radioactive as carbon-14 is. But you still have two electrons, just like the hydrogen and helium boxes of the periodic table. And then you have four more boxes in the periodic table that reaches carbon as the atom. And that shows you one step further in our theory of how an atom really looks. As we turn the page, we get a lot of practice recognizing parts of the periodic table. So this is a great little self-quiz for you to do. Uh, on your own time. So I'm gonna give you a few minutes and pause this video, but work through this and recognize the groups, the periods, label these families, label these regions, and again, recognize those metalloids, because if we know those seven, we're gonna know everybody else. To the left is metal, and everybody else to the right is a non-metal with the exception of hydrogen. So again, you have a spot for a legend down there. Color that in uh, now. All right, so page 15, we're going to see how trendy elements are by testing their families. First thing we're gonna look for is solution color. These bottles aren't gonna be perfect because a lot of them are a little older, but we're gonna show you the families we're dealing with. Our first group of families over here, lithium, sodium, potassium, and cesium. Notice they only have one chlorine because of their positive one charge. Those are our alkali metals. As we move over to our next family, this group of three, calcium, strontium, and barium. Notice they have two chlorines and that's because they like a plus two charge. They're in the alkaline earth family. And then over here, we get a little messy because we're transitioning between charges and they also have a lot of color. 
starting out with this kind of pinkish one. Manganese plus two, iron plus three, cobalt plus two, uh, copper plus two. They do have various charges, but those are the ones we're using. Chlorine in all of these cases is uh, our control. And then lastly over here, we're looking at letter G for our unknown. And as we put these into test tubes, we're also going to uh, recognize their solution color. So that's a better indication rather than in these bottles. So we're gonna do that now. All right, so here we have our first tube. It does have a stick in there, but that's clear for lithium chloride. Here we have sodium chloride clear. Here we have potassium chloride clear in this third one. But also in the same family is cesium chloride clear. Jumping over to our alkaline earth metals, we have calcium chloride clear. We have strontium chloride clear. And we have barium chloride clear. As we get a little further, we see we have this pale pink uh, manganese chloride this kind of uh, orange looking iron chloride, this kind of reddish pink uh, cobalt chloride, it's very pretty blue copper chloride, and then our unknown is clear so we definitely know it's not a transition metal. Alright so to complete our next column we need the flame color and what's unique about fireworks is they soak paper just like we're soaking sticks they burn them in the air and they make color. So we're going to show you that different elements produce different colors, much like one of our labs coming up. So our first one here is lithium chloride. We're going to look to, ob to observe the first two or three seconds before the stick catches on fire and see what we get. So notice here we get that nice pretty color up top. Let's do it one more time. Again, this is lithium chloride. Check out its color, very pretty. Let's move on to sodium chloride. Let's notice the stick's not on fire. This color's being produced by those sodium atoms. One more time. So if you wanna change the color of your bonfire, using metal salts can do that. Next is potassium chloride. This one's a little tougher to see. It has that little pale color. Notice the stick's not on fire. The color we're seeing is because of the potassium. One more time. Next is cesium chloride. This one's also fairly difficult to see. Those big atoms a little harder to motivate. One more time. So those were our alkali metals. Let's move on to now, calcium chloride, also a very difficult one to see. It takes a little bit to get hot. There it goes. A lot of little sparkles to that one. One more time. Notice the stick's not on fire. That color is the calcium. Next we have strontium, a little prettier one. There's strontium one more time. Here we have barium. time barium and then now we move into our transition metals here's manganese not a glitter on that one one more time 
manganese. Now we're moving on to iron. Difficult to get this one motivated, but lots of little sparkles in it as well. Notice my stick's never been on fire, so the color other than the Bunsen burner flame that we're seeing is the ions were burning. All of which have chlorine in, as the control. Here we have cobalt. The only disadvantage of this lab is now we're ruining 4th of July. As you look at fireworks, you're going to know the elements producing them. Again, cobalt one more time. A lot of these are sparkly for transition metals. My personal favorite is this one, coming up for copper. And one last time for copper. Very pretty color. And then our unknown. Our unknown should match one of the previous. Just not a transition metal because again it had no color. So it's either an alkali metal or an alkaline earth metal. We'll have other tests to help out. But from our first seven choices, which one does this best represent? Unknown letter G. One more time. Very, very bright yellow. And that does it for our flame tests. All right, so now we should be working our way across to our third column, ammonium carbonate. And again, because families are trendy, they should act alike. So we're going to add a few drops of ammonium carbonate to each one and notice what happens. Nothing much there. Nothing much there. Nothing much there, and nothing much there. So notice in our first family we have no reaction. So you can write that in your lab report. As we get to our next family, this would be at calcium. So this should be our fifth tube over. Watch this one. So now it's got a milky color. And let's go to the next one. Milky color. Go to our next one, which is our last family member, barium chloride, and milky color. So notice in these three family members here, what we're seeing is very cloudy. It's precipitating. In a later chapter, that's going to make a whole lot more sense when we look at solubility tables. But again, these four over here did absolutely nothing. They stayed clear the entire time. As we move over to our transition metals, we're going to add to our pale pink uh, manganese. Now to our iron. Even bubbles out of that one. Iron is considered a Lewis acid, something we don't teach you, but that's why we're getting that reaction. And lastly, the copper. Let's look at those a little bit closer. Notice where we added that solution. Those four all get cloudy. Some of them even bubble. Families act the same. They have a trend to do the same chemistry. So the most important one is this one. This is our unknown. And remember, it's going to want to match one of these two families, either by staying clear like the alkali metals or turning cloudy. We already know it's not a transition metal because it didn't have a color. We already know it had a bright yellow flame, so let's see what happens here. And as we added our ammonium carbonate, nothing to see. So we know it's in family one, alkali metals, and we know it's also got a bright yellow flame. So again, we have unknown letter G. So unknown letter G, 
And as we have this table, we should be able to now answer on the back page, which metal ion do we have? So take a minute to look at your data and circle the metal that you think matches both the ability to not precipitate and to have a yellow flame. So you're probably wondering why you never did the ammonium phosphate. And that's because we skipped it. But by adding ammonium phosphate to the same set of tubes, uh, we had to refill them. But I did that for you already to save some time. We're getting the exact same results. The first four, no reaction for the alkali metals. The next three, alkaline earth metals, we got the same cloudiness we saw earlier. We see again. And then as we move to the transition metals, same thing we see again. Cloudiness for each one sometimes bubbles, and then still or unknown did nothing. So even though we skipped over it, turns out the same results for carbonates and phosphates because families are trendy. All right, so last step to find our partner. We already know that it has a metal. Found that on the front page through precipitates and flames. Now we need to find its group 17 halogen ion, and notice in our case now, sodium is the control. So we have those three bottles laid out. We have G laid out. Uh, we're going to go ahead and pause this and add those to our test tubes. Our reagents that we're using over here, we'll come back and use those in a minute. All right, so here we have some hexane. Hexane is uh, formula C6H14. It's basically two carbons short of the major component in gasoline called octane. So we're going to give it a little squirt. Notice this is going to give it a two-layer kind of orientation, just like oil floats on water. So does hexane. So as we look at that test tube, notice there's two layers there um, because hexane's lighter floating on top. Next we're going to add uh, one drop of nitric acid. Nitric acid is nasty stuff, so we're in gloves. So one drop each, roughly. Nothing exciting yet. Again, our sodium chloride, sodium bromide, sodium iodide are our first three tubes. Letter G is our last tube over here for our unknown. And then now comes for some of our color changes we're expecting to see. And we're adding some ultra bleach. So as we add our bleach, we're looking for a color change. But more importantly, we're looking for something to change color in that topmost layer. And then here's our unknown. So take a minute to recognize your unknown. What we're seeing a lot of is our bottom color. So let's go one at a time real quick and show you what's happening. We have chlorine with chlorine bleach. Notice nothing because it's chlorine and chlorine. But here we have chlorine and bromide. And we see that kind of orange color on top as well as a little bit on bottom. Iodine, as long as our bleach doesn't kill it. Notice on top, we get a purple color to show up, just like we saw iodine a moment ago. Our bleach is pretty strong, so it's killing it a little bit. Definitely dark on the bottom. But that magenta color that we see on top, same magenta color we saw in experiment one. And then for our unknown, looks like we have our match. And then we just have a few questions to answer. So as you look at your lab book, now we know who to circle for our halogen based on our color match. Come back in a minute for our questions. All right, so to answer the questions, they say, in the element sodium, how many core electrons and valence electrons? Remember, valence electrons is the Roman numeral. So find sodium on the periodic table. Look above it for its Roman numeral. It's in family one or Roman numeral one. Sodium also has 11 total electrons so to answer that, we need to know that of the 11, one is in the valence, the rest are in the core. Question two, it says, which main group family, so transition metals aren't main group, form precipitate? So look back at your data to recognize that answer. Which one precipitates is the one that turned cloudy of our first two families. Next, they do say the transition metals, which is a region, they're not as trendy because they're not in the same kind of families as we'd expect our first two. But when you look at manganese, iron, cobalt, and copper. What do they have in common with the periodic table? Are they the same vertically or horizontally? 
And if they're the same horizontally, what does that mean? And particularly, which period would they be in? Lastly, number four says if a firework explodes and produces a green color. So what would be a green firework? Which cation would produce a green color in our flame test? Look at your data for that one. And this lab is finished.